pleasure today to introduce Professor Richard Parker. Uh, Richard is a graduate of the University of New England, where he undertook a BSc and then a PhD in psychology, physics and music, which um, I've just heard a bit about. Um, he now works at the University of Graz in Austria, and he's visiting the University of Adelaide as part of an extensive tour of Australia. He's going to speak on his perspective that global climate change is a matter of life and death for enormous numbers of people, especially in developing countries. And I have to say, I've also discovered that while Richard is travelling around Australia, he's doing so by road to leave a low-carbon footprint. So, welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Robert. And thanks for allowing me to give my talk, although I'm kind of qualified in a different area. I should turn this on. Ah, oh, yes. Here we go. That might be better. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, try to be systematic about this question. Is, is climate change a matter of life and death for many people, and how many people, and how do we estimate those numbers? That's basically my aim. And um, so just to get the, ro the ball rolling, um, everybody knows this graph. The temperature is going up on average, the global mean surface temperature, and the main reason is human uh, activities and emissions. And so if uh, anything becomes complicated during my talk, the main point is that we just have to stop emitting. Nobody disagrees with this. Um, and before continuing, I should uh, talk briefly about the relationship between the temperature increase and the amount of carbon that's been burned. So um, some scientists have estimated that we have approximately 5 trillion tonnes of carbon available for burning in the Earth's crust, uh, readily accessible in the form of oil, gas, and coal. And um, the question then is, what would happen if all of that was burned? Uh, and so according to this graph, the blue line, the temperature would go by, up by 10 degrees. Now, in fact, we have no idea. This is a very uh, approximate guess. And I should just talk briefly about this relationship because there's some confusion about it. Um, I will be assuming in my talk that there's a, an approximately linear relationship between the amount of carbon burned and the temperature increase, which is the blue line. But there's also a simple physical model, which is well known, uh, which says that if you double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperature goes up by a certain amount, which is approximately three degrees. And that's the red line going off to the side. Um, and the difference between these two graphs is uh, that what I've written at the bottom here, the ability of soils and oceans to absorb CO2, which falls as the temperature rises. And so that accounts for the difference. Um, the, the simple physical model is not accounting for this changing ability of soils to absorb CO2. So, um, so the red line is far too optimistic. When you take into account this uh, changing absorption, the, the line goes up more approximately linearly like that. And so my question is, uh, on top of this, uh, how many people will die prematurely as a result of global warming, which is an additional question. Now, um, and before getting into the detail, I just would like to emphasize that um, the United Nations has made absolutely no progress whatsoever in, in slowing down global carbon emissions. Uh, they've, going, they've been going up for 2% per year for the last 10 or 20 years, um, which is the same period during which the United Nations has met uh, every year with the aim of reducing global emissions. The only time the emissions went down was after the global finance crisis in 2008, and that was, of course, nothing to do with the conference about reducing emissions. And we could also say that um, the footprint of individuals has not been going down either, because um, if we want to reduce um, carbon emissions, then another way to look at it is to say each one of us should reduce our emissions. And so I've been um, talking to my colleagues in my academic discipline about reducing flying to conferences and I've been doing that too, but I haven't noticed uh, many people doing the same. Um, the number of people who are actually doing these things on the right side, less flying, less driving, less eating meat, having less children, is not very many. And so we could say, um, on the whole, progress has been very bad towards solving this problem. And so, um, uh, and one of the main reasons for that is climate denial. This is all just part of my introduction. So um, climate denial could be defined as lies, half-truths, and logical fallacies to justify business as usual. And there are many different kinds of excuses for this, right? Uh, the one I like very much is this one, we're done for anyway. Um, many of my um, very highly educated or, or green-oriented friends tell me this 
and that's their reason for not actually changing, which is a very interesting point because actually we're not done for anyway. It's not quite that, not quite that bad yet. So, um, so what are our priorities, right? I particularly like this picture which popped into my Facebook feed. Uh, we're talking about all kinds of trivial things in politics, trivial by comparison to the threat of extinction. Um, so in order to be systematic about this question, how big are the problems, uh, we can try simple uh, rules of risk assessment, which you can find in engineering and in insurance. Um, the biggest risks involve both high probabilities and high damage. And according to this idea, climate change is actually riskier than all of these catastrophes, catastrophes listed here, nuclear war, global epidemic, hostile artificial intelligence, uh, because climate change is going to happen with a very high probability. Um, the things that we're talking about in climate change research are um, going to happen with probabilities between 50 and 100 percent, uh, which is higher than those other things over there. And so that's the reason why one might regard climate change as the most risky thing facing humans today. And uh, just to um, illustrate that point, um, let me talk about a comparison between three kinds of risk. The first risk here is the risk of a bridge falling down, right? Um, so if you imagine you're building a bridge, uh, you don't want it to fall down, but in fact it's unavoidable that with a certain probability it will fall down because every construction falls down with a certain probability. Let's say it's one in a thousand, and if the bridge falls down, then a hundred people are going to die. That means uh, when you're building the bridge, you're actually effectively killing one-tenth of a person just by building the bridge. Uh, if you make a nuclear power plant, uh, everything could go wrong and maybe one million people could die. That's um, perhaps what happened uh, when Chernobyl went wrong in the 1980s. Uh, according to some estimates, up to a million people may have died prematurely of cancer because of radiation. So, uh, and that might also happen with a probability of one in a thousand. And in that, if that's true, then when you build this nuclear power plant, you're effectively killing a thousand people because that's the product of these two numbers, and most people would agree that's unacceptable. Now, that's nothing compared to climate change, right? Because in the case of climate change, the number of people who die prematurely might be a billion, or 10% of the future world population, and the probability that this will happen is actually probably higher than 50%. I just wrote to you 100% because it's an order of magnitude, which makes the risk absolutely phenomenal. It's so enormous compared to any other risk that we have ever faced. Um, and so why do we consider this risk to be relatively small? Well, one way to look at this is the psychological approach. Um, the availability heuristic, according to these authors, says that a future event seems less likely if you can't remember something similar. And of course, climate change never happened before this kind of climate change. So nobody has any idea what it's going to be like. And um, so there are some very interesting historical examples. Um, why did the Titanic have so few lifeboats? Because an accident of that kind had never happened before. There'd been many shipwrecks, uh, smaller ships and sailing ships, but there hadn't been a big ship full of um, rich people smoking cigars going down with enormous numbers of deaths. And um, wars in the last century uh, were consistently underestimated. The risk of going to war was consistently underestimated because each war that came along was completely different from the previous ones due to the new technologies used for fighting wars. So this is why we underestimate the risk. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the risk measured in terms of human lives and I should uh, try to justify why I take human lives as a measure. Um, of course, you, uh, climate change will have terrible effects in many areas. And here's a list. Um, in the media, we often hear about money and jobs. These are the arguments used often not to do something about climate change. And then the next point in the list is coral reefs and rainforests, uh, which, of course, are enormously valuable. And I would never question how valuable those things are. Um, but there are other stuff in the list which may be even more valuable, at least from our human perspective, our anthropocentric human perspective. And I would like to claim that um, human lives is actually the most valuable thing from our perspective. And for that reason, I would like to um, measure 
the size of this coming disaster today in terms of human lives. And I will be neglecting the other things, or said another way, I'll be assuming that the other losses are somehow proportional to the losses in terms of premature deaths. Uh, so this is my strategy. I would like to focus on people rather than money. Perhaps you know the literature about the cost of inaction, which uh, works out how much money we could spend now to prevent a climate change problem in the future by comparison to what that climate change problem will cost, right? This is the cost of inaction problem. I'm going to try and talk about human lives instead of money. Um, so there's a very solid foundation for using a human life as a measure of value, and you can find this in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. The word equal occurs very often in this document. And so the, the point is that all humans are regarded as equal in international law. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're male or female, black or white, old or young, abled or disabled, and so on. So I'm going to assume that, for the purpose of my talk, that um, every human, uh, leaving out such controversial issues as abortion and, um, and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, assisted dying, right? Um, we're leaving out those things and saying humans considered as members of everyday society are equal. Uh, and before complaining about fossil fuels, it's important to emphasize the enormous advantages of fossil fuels, um, in particular for human quality of life and for longevity. Um, so so um, fossil fuels can be considered the most important factor in the Industrial Revolution, revolution which led to enormous improvements in human quality of life and in medicine and in food supplies, uh, transport, manufacture, construction and so on. Um, according to the United Nations, um, global mean life expectancy uh, is increasing from 46 to 83 years starting in 1960 and extrapolated toward 2100, which is an absolutely massive increase, um, largely because of the availability of fossil fuels. The trouble with the United Nations estimate is they didn't uh, consider climate change, which obviously will change that prediction. So um, having talked about the benefits of fossil fuels now, um, it's very clear what the problems with fossil fuels are. And um, I'm going to use this list in order to estimate the human cost of fossil fuels. And the list comes, of course, from standard climate research literature and from the IPCC. So. Um, we can regard this as a list of reasons why people might die prematurely in the future in connection with climate change. So the first point is direct heat, and um, if wet bulb temperature exceeds your skin temperature, then you can no longer regulate your body heat, and then you die within a few hours. And this is something that's never happened, but in coming decades it might start to happen in certain countries, and there could be absolutely disastrous uh, results from that. Um, extreme weather can uh, kill people in different ways. Um, it's possible that flooding can lead to epidemics. Uh, forest fires is a very uh, important topic right now, which can indirectly lead to death via various mechanisms. Uh, two billion people in the world depend on groundwater and one billion on glaciers for their water supply. And all of these things are threatened in the short or long term by climate change. Um, hunger is an important reason why people will die in the future in connection with climate change. Uh, there's agricultural problems, there's loss of biodiversity, uh, there's loss of um, yields of fish because of ocean warming and so on. Um, and in that regard, it's important to remember that the population of Africa, which is currently about 1.3 billion, will probably, probably be approaching 4 billion by the end of the century, which is a three times increase. Uh, that's because of continuing uh, large population increases in some developing countries. And that's, uh, that's like a pre-programmed catastrophe of enormous proportions, and um, people are not talking about it because it's so scary. Um, uh, diseases will be migrating from one place to the other, and in certain cases becoming more severe. I'm not an expert on that topic. Uh, rising seas can lead to mass migration, so we can imagine hundreds of millions of people um, trying to migrate to a new place where they're actually unsure where that new place might be and how um, far-right-wing governments might greet them when they arrive. And uh, there are also problems when there's a, when there's a river flowing through um, 
two different countries which are competing for the same water and they might start fighting over that. So, um, so from this list we see uh, many different ways in which people might die in the future in connection with climate change. And I haven't mentioned yet the feedbacks, and it's important not to forget these feedbacks. So uh, there are different ways in which the temperature can go up without any input from human beings, because the warming itself produces a, a circular process which keeps on warming. And um, here are four of those possible uh, processes. The albedo uh, um, idea is that ice um, melts, which changes the color of the surface of the Earth, so that instead of having ice, on the surface of the Earth, you have blue water, and the blue water absorbs more energy, which produces more warming. Uh, when thermofrost thaws, it releases um, greenhouse, greenhouse gases, which in turn cause more thawing. Uh, with forest fires um, are releasing carbon dioxide, which in turn produce more forest fires. And air conditioning in hot weather um, often requires fuel to be burned, which in turn produces more heat waves. So, um, so I, often the literature doesn't talk about these things, and it's very uncertain actually what's going to happen, uh, how serious these effects will be at different levels, two, three, or four degrees of warming in the future. Um, so um, if we were going to go to court and accuse some people of causing the future deaths of innocent people, uh, we would have to demonstrate that they actually did cause those deaths, and then we would be dealing with uh, different kinds of causality, uh, which I've tried to illustrate in this slide here. Um, so the first point I would make, and that's related to the heading here, climate change and poverty, the first point is that probably most or all um, premature deaths in the future in connection with climate change will also be associated with poverty, right? So it's usually the case that both of those things are happening at the same time and the combination will cause the deaths of people. And so if that's the case, we have to consider how the actions of people now are exacerbating climate change and poverty in different ways. Um, so it's obvious, um, probably to most people in this room, because I'm preaching to the converted here, um, that burning carbon can increase greenhouse gases and greenhouse gases increase the temperature and that the temperature has many effects which I showed in the previous slide and that can lead to future premature deaths. But um, in a court of law one could argue about whether those things really are causing that and whether one is really responsible when one does one of those things in the list. And the same thing applies to poverty. We have an unfair global economic system uh, which has a terrible history and this is the reason why we have poverty in developing countries. Uh, that it's an interesting legal question to what extent have individuals caused that poverty where they could have actually reduced it. So um, the point of this slide is basically that we have causality which is sometimes a bit uncertain in a, in a legal sense. So now I'm finally going to start talking about the detail that I promised at the start. Um, how can we estimate the number of people who will die in future in connection with climate change? And I found some uh, existing literature in the internet. So the first point is uh, by the World Health Organization. You can go to their homepage and find these, these uh, estimates. The World Health Organization has estimated that 250,000 people will be dying per year uh, in the coming few decades from climate change. And most of them will die from the, for the same reason that people die in connection with poverty prematurely, which is malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, heat, heat stress. Um, now, I think that this is a rather conservative estimate, and I should explain uh, briefly why I think that is, right? Because we know for sure that three million children are dying every year from hunger. Uh, that is a, a, there's no doubt about that figure. And, um, and uh, the number of people dying in connection with climate change must be considered relative to the people who are dying already in connection with poverty. And it's very hard to say that one individual person has been, has been killed by climate change, right? Because the attribution is a difficult problem. So I, I would like to claim that 250,000 year per year is too small relative to the 10 million per year, approximately, of people who are dying in connection with poverty. And uh, obviously the numbers are going up after 2050. We are now causing deaths much later because the carbon dioxide we produce now stays in the atmosphere for centuries, um, so we have to consider more long-term 
values. So the second point on this list is from the Euro Environmental Protection Association in the United States. I'm not actually very interested in this point because it's mainly about a, a rich or developed country, although many people might say the United States is not necessarily a rich country, but um, uh, I'm more concerned with the, the vast majority of deaths in connection with pro climate change which will happen in developing countries uh, for different reasons which I've listed here. Uh, and the third point is from Dara International, which is a kind of uh, NGO, uh, um, and they made some rather detailed estimates of climate change effects in many different countries in 2012. Uh, they predicted 400,000 per year, um, considerably more than the World Health, World Health Organization. I think it was more realistic, and they said 5 million by 2020 and 1 million per year by 2030. And I'm going to argue that this number could go up to 10 million per year by 2100 um, on the assumption that the effects of climate change will gradually get worse throughout the century. Um, and this is what we expect simply by looking at the IPCC predictions of the, te of the temperature gradually going up and, and considering the, what's realistic pos realistically possible in the area of emissions reductions. So um, I, I've been uh, showing you what could be called bottom-up estimates, these estimates here. Um, I'm going to use the word bottom-up estimate in the following sense, an estimate which is analytical, um, based on analysing a big problem into small parts. Um, empirical means based on the data that we can collect right now. Uh, deductive means that um, if we know what's happening now, we deduce what's happening in the future based on hypothesis. Uh, and testable means that we could say this year we expect so many deaths in five years and then in five years time we could test and see if it was correct. Right? Um, and I'm, I would like to claim that um, in order to understand what's going to happen in a completely uncertain future in a, in a hundred years, we can't rely completely on bottom-up estimates because um, there's some, some very surprising things that could happen and we have to be open for surprises so we have to be more exploratory or inductive. Um, so, so you see what I mean, we have to um, take the, look at the whole world and we have to consider all possible catastrophes that could happen with different possible probabilities. Perhaps you know the idea from psychology that a, a psychological test can be either reliable or valid. A reliable test is like you repeat the test many times and you get the same answer, but it's not necessarily the correct answer. It's just consistent, right? And a valid test is something that actually tests what you want to test. Uh, so what I want to test, I want to find out how many people will die in a completely unpredictable future situation, and therefore I'm aiming more for validity and less for, for, less for reliability. Now here's something uh, even more concrete. A philosopher um, in the United States by the name of John Nolt wrote a paper published in 2011 in which he estimated the effect of the average American's greenhouse gas emissions and he did exactly what I'm talking about today, uh, how many people in the future will die as a result. And it's interesting just to see briefly how he calculated that so you get some feeling for how the calculation works. So he started off uh, by saying the average American emits so many tons of carbon dioxide, lives for a certain number of years, has a total number of um, emissions, and then maybe if this person was born and died in certain years, um, then the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere will have gone up from one number to another number uh, relative to the value before industrialization. And this, uh, this proportion is part of the calculation. And then uh, how much of the U global emissions are produced by the US and what is the US population? And all of these figures go into a calculation. And then uh, he proceeds to assume that the effect of our carbon dioxide emissions will last for a thousand years. Now, that's, um, this is very hand wavy, right? Because uh, carbon dioxide that humans are creating now is going to stay in the atmosphere for many centuries, maybe even longer than a thousand years, or maybe shorter, um, some proportions and some levels. I'm not sure exactly of the details. But a thousand years is a hand wavy, good rough estimate, which corresponds to 40 generations. And, he assumed the population would be this, and there would be three generations at one time alive. Um, and then he assumed, uh, this is a very risky and odd assumption, he said that 4% of future people in the coming 1,000 years 
will suffer or die due to today's emissions, which is, um, I'm not sure where he got that from, but it's actually not so bad, maybe. Anyway, the end of this calculation was that the average American is causing the suffering or death of one or two future people. And I'm going to assume that that's approximately correct just um, now for the next few minutes and think about what that means. So let's imagine we have 7 billion people in the world. In the future, there'll be 10 billion. Um, here are the richest billion over here, the blue ones, and here are the poorest billion over here. So according to John Nolt, uh, every person in this blue bar here is effectively, prematurely killing one future person in the poor countries, right? Now, obviously, it's more complicated than that because we have the first billion and the second billion and the third billion, and the, the richest billion are producing more emissions than the second richest billion, and so the, the richest billion are effectively killing more people than the second richest. And so you see these blue bars go down like this, and the orange bars gradually go up. The effect on people is greater and greater the less money they have. Um, because they have less opportunities for adaptation to, to climate change. So I don't know the exact shape of this graph, and maybe one day someone might do it more exactly, but this is the basic idea that I'm thinking of. So we could ask whether this girl is now telling the truth. She says you'll die of old age, but she'll die of climate change. What is the probability that that's actually correct? Uh, depending on what country she's living in, right? I, I would like to ask that as a scientific question, so we have, a, have our feet on the ground when we're talking about this topic. And in order to do that, I'm going to continue in a very approximate fashion. Um, it's impossible to know these things exactly, and so we have to accept a certain amount of uncertainty. Um, first order approximation or zeroth order or just educated guesses are, in my opinion, better than nothing, right? The topic is so important we can't <coughs> ignore it just because we're uncertain about the exact numbers. Um, so here's a graph which is intended to show the number of deaths with or without climate change during this century. So um, it's very approximate, right? It's just a guess. So we're starting in 2000 and going to 2100, that's this century, and I'm going to assume that right now the number of deaths in association with poverty is 10 million per year, which is this point up here. And I should say that that's also just a guess because, of course, poverty is defined in different ways, and whether, someone is, whether the death of a person has been caused by poverty or not is, of course, a difficult question to answer. And so I do know, as I said before, that three million children are dying of um, hunger every year, and there are many other deaths in connection with poverty, so I'm taking an order of magnitude estimate of 10. Um, so let's assume that the number goes down without climate change, because in the last few decades, the number of deaths in connection with poverty has been steadily falling, um, partly because of economic growth in developing countries and partly because of the efforts of international aid organizations and the Millennium Development Goals. And so if there was no climate change, we could confidently and optimistically uh, expect that the number of deaths would continue to go down. And so I've just invented this number, five million per year at the end. And I'm also um, going to guess also very approximately that climate change will instead make the number of deaths go up. And in fact, right now we may have reached the the, the lowest level ever in the history of humanity of the number of deaths per year because from now on it's going up, right? And I actually have some other data to suggest that. Uh, so the difference between the two numbers at the end, 15 and 5, is 10. Um, and the area of the triangle on the graph, the area of this triangle is the total number of people who, according to this model, are dying prematurely in this century as a result of climate change, which is 500 million. Um, and then I'm going to assume that something else happens in the next century, but I don't know what, but maybe another 500 million. We'll just limit the calculation arbitrarily to two centuries and very approximately come up with the number one billion. And this is all based on two degrees of warming. I'll come back to that in a moment. So um, this is a, a rather more exact picture of what I'm trying to claim here, right? So I'm claiming that if there's two degrees of warming altogether in the next one or two centuries, there'll be one billion <coughs> deaths caused by climate change. But we're very unsure about this number, right? So we can imagine a probability distribution. 
we can imagine a best case scenario where only in inverted commas 300 million people die in connection with climate change on this catastrophic possibilities which could lead to that in the next few centuries. And um, we can also consider the endpoints here where it's very unlikely that anything would happen. So imagine uh, this number here, 100 million, I'm going to claim that it's completely impossible that the number would be that small. That is hyper-optimistic, right? And this one over here is hyper-pessimistic, that's like the entire future world population. That's not going to happen at two degrees warming, right? So let me go through this graph one step at a time. The extreme best case, uh, 100 million deaths spread out over one or two centuries. Well, that would be very, very good outcome. Uh, if we consider what Dara predicted in 2000, they said 1 million per year. If that keeps up for 100 years, we have 100 million already, and it surely will be more than 1 million per year. So I think that's an extreme best case. So the extreme worst case is the entire human population. Um, now, uh, the likely best case scenario is this one here on the left. The likely best case, we could consider that some um, corresponding to the IPCC report from 2018 in which uh, warming of 2 degrees C was compared with warming of 1.5 um, in order to show that uh, 2 degrees C, C is in many respects much worse than 1.5 and therefore the international community should strive for 1.5. So many of you will have read parts of this report. Um, so I've tried to summarise the main consequences of global warming of 2 degrees relative to 1.5 in this picture. Um, and I'm assuming that corresponds to a relatively optimistic case. Um, I'm assuming that these things really will happen. Um, when the IPCC says, says um, that things will happen with high probability or very high probability or moderately high probability, um, for my purposes today, very approximate, these things really will happen, right? And uh, anything else is likely to be even worse. So that's why I'm calling this a best case scenario. So if you look through all of these things that can happen to humans, um, at the, which, which will be worse with two degrees compared to 1.5, you can easily imagine that 300 million people will die as a result spread out over one or more centuries. Um, the best case scenario should also be optimistic. So um, we can imagine improvements in many areas and work on that basis. So we can imagine that adap adaptation, uh, many people are working on different kinds of climate adaptation and that they will be effective and will save lots of lives and extend lots of lives. We can imagine that agriculture will continue it to improve because um, in developing countries we've had massive in improvements in the efficiency of agriculture in recent decades. Uh, that health services improve, that um, important diseases are combated, uh, in, especially in developing countries. Um, uh, we could imagine, if we were particularly naive, that politics will improve. Uh, right now we've got the worst international politics for some time and maybe suddenly we'll elect great new politicians and they will do good things and maybe we'll suddenly become friendly to refugees and accept them more openly and we'll so so those things are possible and they're part of a um, they're part of a likely best case scenario um, so we this is the likely best case scenario and now I'm going to go to the likely worst case scenario uh, if we want to understand a likely worst case we have to look at all different articles in good academic journals uh, which are talking about big catastrophes which were with a probability of not 100%, right? With probabilities somehow, somehow like 20% or 50%. Uh, so perhaps you know that um, if all air pollution was removed from the air tomorrow, that would add 0 0.5 degrees to global mean temperature because the air pollution is stopping uh, radiation coming to the Earth's surface. That's kind of catastrophic. Um, we talked about wet bulb temperatures. There are some interesting papers about this. Uh, combining high population and low food production, which I mentioned already. Uh, soils all over the world are becoming less fertile, and um, there doesn't seem to be a good solution to this problem, which could lead to massive problems with agriculture. Uh, we talked about water shortages for many people. Um, Conflicts and resources wars, um, 
last year there was a lot of news about extinctions, many species going extinct, uh, which could again have massive effects on human uh, water and food supplies. Uh, melting permafrost could even cause new pathogens to emerge, to which humans have little resistance, so a bit like the plague in the 14th century. So there are, there are actually many ways in which um, uh, totally unprecedented catastrophic things could happen, and that's uh, why I'm saying that uh, Likely worst case is three billion deaths, even with only two degrees of warming. So from this I'm going to derive something called the 1,000 tonne rule. And the 1,000 tonne rule is very simple, everybody can understand it. If you burn a trillion tonnes of carbon, you increase the global mean surface temperature by two degrees and cause a billion future premature deaths. Therefore, if you burn a thousand tonnes of carbon, which is a trillion divided by a billion, you cause one future premature death. Um, now, I should emphasize this is a, a rough estimate, right? So it might be somewhere between 500 and 3,000 or something, right? It's, but it, I th but um, it corresponds well to this graph, and, and I can um, argue about five different points on this axis, and so I'm relatively sure that the peak is around here somewhere. So then we can ask the question, how many deaths are being caused by fossil fuel industries today? And that gives a completely new um, impression of the damage caused by fossil fuel industries. And before I do that, I would like to emphasize that uh, this 1,000 tonne rule actually applies to a certain part of this graph. Now, this graph is the amount of carbon we burn going up to 5 trillion tonnes, which is apparently how much is available. And on this axis now, I'm writing down the number of deaths in billions, and 10 billion is the projected future of global population. Um, assuming that we get an apocalypse at 10 degrees when we burn all of the 5 trillion tonnes, and basically most or all of humans are dead at that case, then the line goes through this point here. And if the line somehow goes between these two points, we don't know where it goes. We don't know if it's straight or not, or curving up or down. We have no idea. Um, you can see that, in fact, on this line, the amount of carbon that you have to burn to cause a future death is 500 tonnes, seen in this big perspective. But if we go down into this little box here, 2 degrees C of warming is happening when we burn 1 trillion tonnes of carbon, and I'm assuming that 1 billion deaths will happen. In that little box, 1,000 tonnes of carbon are necessary to cause a future death. So basically what I'm saying is it will become easier to kill a future person by burning carbon as we get into this rather out of control area. Hopefully humanity will manage to stay down here, but I'm not sure how optimistic you are. So um, here are the predictions for fossil fuel industries. Um, Australian coal, there's 400 million tonnes of coal being mined per year, uh, which are about 300 million tonnes of carbon, uh, which according to my calculation is causing 300,000 future deaths every year. The planned Adani Carmichael man will cause altogether 2 million deaths if it goes ahead, um, which I guess it won't, right? And it, they will keep mining for decades and decades till all the coal is gone. That would be the human cost of that mine. A big airport is causing tens of deaths every day. Uh, just one aeroplane uh, flying three times back and forth on a long haul flight causes one death. Um, China is causing, according to this calculation, three million future deaths every year, just the emissions of China, which is a large part of the world's emissions. The, so the total number of people dying in connection with poverty every year right now is about 10 million. And according to my estimate, this is approximately in the same ballpark, the same number of people who we are killing prematurely in the future. So coming back to this girl with her poster, um, we can ask how likely is it that anyone, how likely will climate change cause your death, right? It depends where you're living, of course, right? So I'm claiming that the global mean probability is 10% uh, that climate change will cause maybe anyone's death 
in the world, but in poor countries it might be higher, like 50%. So if you go to Bangladesh and you see children playing in Bangladesh, I'm assuming that the probability that those children will die prematurely because of climate change is 50%, which is absolutely, I mean, I can't imagine anything more shocking than that. Um, in rich countries, the number is going to be much lower because the rich countries will be able to afford different kinds of adaptation. Educated guesses. So um, some implications are if people in rich countries are really causing future premature deaths, then everyone must reduce their carbon dioxide footprint um, individuals because each one of us, we don't want to cause the future death of a person. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And one tonne of carbon dioxide per year is approximately how much photosynthesis there is in the world divided by the world population, right? The, the sustainable photosynthesis of all plants in the world. Um, if fossil fuel industries are really causing thousands of future deaths, they must stop as quickly as possible without causing additional deaths. So in this case, I'm claiming that the criterion for slowing down the fossil fuel economy is not an economic criterion, it's a human criterion. We should do a kind of mathematical optimization calculation to minimize the number of human deaths as we slow down the fossil fuel industry. And thirdly, uh, climate deniers are probably the most important um, individual causes of climate change because they have prevented climate action systematically for decades. Uh, if they are really causing thousands of future deaths, they should be tried by the International Criminal Court. Uh, now, I see time is rushing away, so I'm not going to say much about crimes against humanity or Holocaust denial. Um, so um, let me say something about this. Um, so this is very depressing, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's very natural to feel um, depressed about this and have a feeling of, of powerlessness, right? Uh, so it's important to, um, to apply a kind of psychology for yourself and others. How do we overcome our powerlessness? So one point is to get active and have fun. Well, we have to find ways of uh, changing this problem around, which is fun for everybody. Um, so I bought this t-shirt, uh, it says Climate Action Now, and I discovered that people were smiling at me when I wore it. I thought, that's great. I like it when people smile at me. Um, so we can do some things about honesty. People are scared of talking about this, right? Often you talk about it at the dinner table and everything goes quiet, right? Well, we don't want to be scared about that. We can announce that actually we care about children. We actually care about developing countries. It's okay to care about other people. You know, you can say things like that. See what happens. Um, we can consider this rat inside this box. Now, this is a very important piece of psychology. Um, so when the rat presses the lever, uh, out comes the sugar, and the rat gets the sugar, and this motivates the rat to push the lever again, right? You know this basic psychology? Uh, this is called operant conditioning. If we want to motivate our fellow human beings to produce less carbon dioxide, we have to think of ways of giving them immediate rewards or punishments. Um, uh, so so moralising doesn't work very well. I've been moralising at you and it didn't work, right? Um, so we could think of some funny things to say uh, like this. If you really love children, don't have any. Um, wouldn't that be a good slogan? <laughs> People have to understand it. Um, who, was, who was alive when Norm was on TV? Uh, some people, <laughs> yes, very good. Um, cycle daily and eat less meat to be healthy, happy, and sexy. Uh, I'm a music psychologist. We know from scientific research that music makes you happy. Uh, yes, going on trains. Um, now, if you're lonely and you want to meet someone who you're going to spend your life with, you want someone who's caring, honest and responsible, and we're better in the whole world to meet this person than on a climate demonstration. There are the people who actually care about children. Right. Um, so there's all kinds of things that one can do. We can apply the results of positive psychology, how to be happy. Relationships, exercise and flow in your life, these are things that make you happy. They've got nothing to do with burning carbon. Isn't that good? Um, I have too much to talk about here. Um, I'm just going to go, so I want to tell you what I did. Um, so I am a music psychologist and we have conferences in our <coughs> academic discipline, just like every other academic discipline, and people fly in their aeroplanes from all over the world and burn up massive amounts of carbon. 
So we decided to reduce the carbon emissions of our conference by having it simultaneously in four different locations. And it could have been many more than that. It's actually quite easy to do this. You can have many locations for your conference and they communicate with each other virtually and we use YouTube live streams and we use Zoom and different software solutions. And it worked. Anyone can do it. If you would like to organize a conference like this, please ask me for the technical guidelines. So here's my summary. Two degrees of global warming will cause roughly a billion premature human deaths. Uh, burning a thousand tons of carbon causes a future premature death. I actually have no doubt that that's true. Of course, people will argue with me and say, what about cause and effect? And I'll say, well, you know, if you don't burn a thousand tons of carbon, that person in the future will not die, right? I mean, anyway. Uh, people in rich countries are causing future deaths in poor countries approximately one to one. I would be interested to meet one person in the future whose life I'm ending. I mean, how shocking is that? Human lives are even more important than economics and ecology. So, so the Great Barrier Reef is enormously important. I, I really can't underestimate how enormously important that is. But, but when I think of every second child in, in Bangladesh dying because of climate change, that's even more important. You know, we have to get our priorities right. Individual change is as important as government or corporate change. So everyone who is protesting Adani should also be trying to reduce their personal carbon footprint. Um, behavioural change is motivated by immediate rewards and punishments. Um, we have to find ways to make it fun, in other words. Um, everyone can cut their emissions. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention.